League on edge. Concern is growing for fans around Major League Rugby as its second team decides to not participate in 2024. That's right. The New York Ironworkers will not be a part of the upcoming season. Matt and I react to the shocking news and also break down the impact it will have for the upcoming year. We also break down the latest news and notes from the past week. The Fancy Rucker Show starts right now. Where rugby and the world of fantasy sports collide. Welcome to the Fantasy Rucker Show. Bringing fantasy rugby to the masses. Talking all things rugby from the MLR to leagues around the world. We're on top of it. Headphones on, pads off. This is the Fantasy Rucker Show. Now, here are your hosts, Ryan Yee, Matt Yee, and Devin Vanderpool. What's up, everybody? This is episode number 89 of the Fantasy Ruckers Show. Thank you so much for our Fantasy Ruckers League members, our community members, and everyone else tagging along on this journey of trying to make Fantasy Rugby a reality in the MLR. And, oh, news, not so great news, is absolutely overtaking the league right now. And we're going to get into it with you, as always. I'm Ryan Yee, and with me is Matt Yee and Matty. Uh, it's been it's been a shocking past week. I mean, last episode we broke down the shocking yeah. news that uh, the Toronto Arrows were no, not going to participate in 2024. And like I said at the top of the show here, um, it's a league on edge right now because we have another team that has announced it will not be participating in this upcoming season. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with this uh, northeast coast of the league here. This Eastern Conference is being absolutely blown up. Um, but this is just... Just wild news. Uh, definitely didn't expect this, um, and we'll we'll dive into it after we we get all this stuff out of the way. But yeah, what a crazy few months in the MLR. I mean, a couple of weeks in the MLR, and now I think for me, it's just now there's just a lot of questions coming yeah. forward, and I, yeah. and I'm looking forward to having those answered. Well, if you guys have been out of the loop, what has happened is that after, like I said, the Arrows announcing that they will not be participating in the 2024 season, about a week later. The New York Ironworkers have announced unexpectedly, to say the least, that they will not be uh, participating in the 2024 season as well. So in this episode, we're going to break that down, break down the impact that's going to have as a league and also, of course, as uh, as the impact it will have on the world of fantasy MLR. Because uh, the league has responded over the past kind of as it's developed. There is now a way that some of these players may appear. So again, that's going to have an impact here in the world of fantasy and where some of these guys are going to end up. We're going to discuss and break all of that down. And of course, on top of all that the busy offseason continues there's still other teams making a whole bunch of other signings in preparation for 2024 which is uh it's just optimistic to see but yeah the big news being that uh, both toronto and new york will not be here in the 2024 year but hey before we get into any of it uh like we say every single episode if you aren't already making sh- make sure you're giving us a follow at the fantasy ruckers uh the handles are up above on the youtube video uh down below in the description if you're listening on the pod and again we say it every single episode but we are continuing to do work here to make fantasy rugby a reality in the MLR and and myself and the mastermind behind our website Alistair Kirschpool is working on a website here to allow us to expand this to everyone to give everyone an opportunity to play fantasy MLR for this upcoming season so if you want to be first in the know on when that becomes available you want to follow us on all those social media handles join our discord community as well Um, obviously with all this blowing up with the exit of the teams our community has been uh, blowing up as well and there's been some good conversation happening back and forth between our fantasy ruckers community members and then also check out that website fantasyruckers.com for everything you need to know fantasy related stats wise and everything else but matt let's let's hop right into it and i think uh it's the most fitting to just get it out of the way right off the start and let's talk about the the new york iron workers because we did it last episode we broke down kind of what happened with the toronto arrows uh but man this is a shock and you could even argue that this is an even bigger shock than uh, with the Toronto Arrows because at least they, you know, you're pointing to with the Arrows with the passing of Bill Webb and it kind of connecting the dots. It made sense after the fact of of something like that happening, but no one knew, no one thought that the New York Ironworkers weren't going to be a team uh, heading into the 2024 year. And it wasn't until inklings of them not reaching deadlines for for the capital that they needed for the upcoming year, but it just kind of snowballed until the inevitable announcement that was that uh, New York was not going to be a part of 2024. Yeah, I mean, maybe we should have saw coming with the lack of 
kind of how we were pointing out to last week of like just the lack of announcements that they were doing. Uh, It seemed like they were supposed to have some sort of signings announced, but they just have had been, they've been silent, you know, at least with the arrows, they, they were active in the signing market. They were re-signing players. They were signing, making trades. New York was just absolutely quiet on that front. Um, it seems to me based on, I think America's rugby news and their article that it was just based on some of the investors that just either didn't want to, or, or didn't feel like they, they should put up the capital and, and to, to have the New York ironworkers in MLR 2024. Uh, but it's sad to see, uh, it's super surprising, you know, really bummed out again for the players, um, that this is, you know, this was a quality side and this had some quality players on it. Um, and these guys are going to find themselves and we'll get into how they're going to find themselves new, but these guys are going to find themselves in new environments needing to, to kind of make their way onto a roster, compete with other teams that are probably like mostly established. Um, so yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out, but you know, it's tough fantasy wise. Yeah. It's, it's even tougher. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of names. I mean, fantasy related, uh, there were a bunch of guys that I think, people were looking forward to on this New York team that you were excited to kind of have on your squad and you were excited for this New York team to kind of turn it around for this 2024 year, obviously a 2022 MLR champions. And, and, Mm -hmm. and what's crazy to think too, with this league. And I think where there's so much concern is that, um, you know, that's two former champions that this uh, this this uh, league has lost, um, you know, with the L.A. Giltinis having won the championship before. They are no longer in a team that's in existence. Now, the New York Ironworkers are no longer yeah. in existence. They were a team that won the champion. It's just, yeah, there is some concern there. But again, you know, guys like Andrew Coe, guys, guys like Ed Fido, uh, guys like, you know, um, Dylan Fawcett, Dylan Fawcett, guys like, yeah. you know, Jack Hyden. Yeah. Um, you know, to, uh, to see what maybe, um, you know, uh, what some of these other guys were going to do with this explosive New York iron workers team, um, Tay Walden, you know, you to maybe see if he would come back and establish himself more in this lineup and have him more fantasy related. There's just, yeah, a whole bunch of names that are on this list of guys that won't be, uh, at least as of right now on a team for the 2024 year, it is, it is, uh, somewhat concerning here, but we're kind of yeah. taking through the, the, the timeline, but yeah, Matt. Well, I was just going to say that, I mean, we were talking a lot about this whole, uh, we were talking a lot about how they weren't announcing anything. And it seems like according to America's rugby news, they actually had some signings that were, yeah. that were, were rumored to be, I mean, they had Aaron Cruden was apparently going to go there. Charlie Famuina, two former all blacks, Tom Franklin, Nate Oxberger was apparently making the move over there. Um, and Chris Matina as well. So yeah, I mean, Based on their last tweet, their admin tweet, they did have some, I would have made, I would have been pretty excited to announce those signings as well, but uh, they just never came to fruition. You can't make any signings if you don't have a team. And, uh, and yeah, they couldn't get the, uh, couldn't get that down first. Um, But yeah, it, it just kind of paints a picture of like what could have been. Um, And I mean, just the, the, the spotlight that that would have put on the league is would have been wild. And talk about kind of a different type of spotlight that's now on the league because obviously a yeah. whole bunch of kind of, uh, what's the word, kind of cleanup needing to be done by the league now because obviously uh, no brand new league wants to see two of its teams, you know, less than, you know, a handful of months away from the start of your upcoming season have two major franchises, not even, um, you know, not even just like kind of, you know, this is not a, a Dallas Jackals, you know, who is just in it and, and, you know, they just couldn't survive over the past couple of weeks. Or this wasn't like the folding of the Miami Sharks or or a recent no. team. I mean, the Toronto Arrows was a was a, a, a hallmark team for this uh, this league. The New York Ironworkers, you know, established itself as kind of a, a, a marquee, you know, starting off as Rugby New York and then kind of developing through there. Um, but yeah, so uh, on December 6th, Nick Benson, the CEO of Major League uh, Rugby, uh, makes the announcement of the withdrawal of the New York iron workers. Um, obviously there is a, a whole bunch of kind of words in there that kind of talk about how, how grateful they were for this New York, uh, the franchise and, and the, 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 the impact it had over the years that was playing. Um, you know, he points out to that. There are still positive things happening in the past six months and, and the growth of rugby. He's talking about an expansion team in Miami that's making signings and they seem to be doing all right. Um, a relocated Los Angeles teams that we really don't know much about. I'm not, I'm um, not convinced. All right. And yeah, then that, that's why I'm bringing this comment this, this thing up because I, I, my confidence in the league right now is, is it's concerning. 
Um, I think obviously there was a lot of optimism with how busy the off season was with how many signings were happening with the expansion of, you know, Miami with the addition of Los Angeles, but it kind of started off with kind of the unknown with this Los Angeles team with Atlanta moving. Um, and, and it was kind of weird that we haven't heard much kind of updates with regards to that team. And then all of a sudden we're lost without two franchises. Um, I think the way that, uh, I believe, um, uh, 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 it was said online uh, by, I want to say, um, uh, who was it that said that? Um, what's the name here? Uh, insider for 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 MLR. Uh, the, he always has the stuff coming out, Matt. What's Brian the Ray. Guy? Brian Ray came out with a tweet saying that uh, the league's got to get this under control, and, and a good way to do that would be to get out some more information about this Los Angeles team, and that hasn't come down the pipeline. So, my point being that my level of concern with major league rugby right now is, is probably at the highest that it's ever been since following this league. Yeah. And, and I mean, I hope that this is kind of a way that the MLR can look at itself and, and be like, Hey, is this, is the way that we're doing things sustainable? I mean, you look at the past three years of the league and you look at the number of owners that have either moved and, and have sold the team to other owners, how many teams have folded, whether that's due to, you know, issues with the owner or whether that's due to just not being able to put up the funds. And, and these aren't just like, these aren't just teams that are struggling that are, are like not popular teams. I mean, you're looking at the LA Giltinis, you're looking at, like you said, the, the, the New York Ironworkers or rugby, New York, looking at the arrows, which is one of the most prestigious kind of teams or, or the, the historic teams of the MLR. Um, and, and they're not able at some point to put up the funds or get the investment that they need. And, and you start to worry about, hey, look, I get it. Like, we're going to have an MLR 2024. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm confident with that. But what does 2025, what does 2026 look like? If we get an expansion team, how long are they actually going to last? How long is Miami Sharks going to last until the owners realize, hey, I can't keep losing money every year from from doing this? And right. um, yeah, I think it will be interesting to see. It, it Clearly, there's an issue with sustainability uh for these teams um and and yeah uh i don't know this eastern conference is now just in shambles and, yeah. and honestly i'm not convinced that la is is has a team yet i don't think that they're gonna have a team um i don't think they're gonna be ready for mlr 2024 i think it's going to be what is that that's a 10 10 team league now 10 team league yeah that would be a 10 team league um yeah i don't think i don't think la is gonna gonna be there um just because, like you said, right, my confidence in the league is just at an all time low at the moment. And I right. just don't think that I don't think that there's a way. If anything, we've seen that what silence means is that nothing has been nothing has been finalized sure. and they may there's risk that they may now, not be I part will, of the league. I will say that there has been some sort of communication because it, it, it sounded like I believe um, there was talk. Someone was able to um, talk with a New England Free Jacks president who said that he's been in contact with the ownership group and the leadership group with the L.A. team. And they said that everything seems to be going. But again, until I see kind of an official announcement or anything like that, it's hard to kind of trust well, that at this yeah. point, especially with everything that's happened. Um, but what's interesting to me, Matt, is the timing of everything, because we were so optimistic with this league, uh, especially with the way that they were able to get through COVID, you know, with the pandemic season and be able to kind of get through. I know that it kind of shut down a little bit through, but the fact that teams were able to make it out and there were seasons after that, it's weird that the timing is now that teams are starting to kind of back out here and, and not get the investment that they needed. For the Toronto Arrows, I kind of understand with the whole Bill Webb situation. Um, I guess with the New York, it's just they they weren't willing to put in that investment. And I, I don't know if it highlights the fragility that some of these franchises have in terms of just the number of people that want to invest into these franchises. And and, and we said it last episode, th this is a long-term investment. These teams are not making money right now. No. Um, and it's, it's, it's about, it's a side project. It's hard to find people that are willing to bite the bullet and lose money for the passion of a sport. And not everyone has the passion that Bill Webb has um, to, to, yeah. to go out there and, and do this. But um I guess we'll see. I don't know. It's just, it's a very interesting state. And I don't know. And, and we'll kind of transition into this, Matt, but some teams did release statements of their own. And it sounds like they are the passionate ones. Uh, we got a statement from the Utah Warriors. Um, we got a statement from Seattle Seawolves. We got a statement from the Houston Sabercats. Um, 
who are all acknowledging the fact that, you know, this is something that has happened. But here, the state of our our team right now is that we're, we're good to go. Um, I don't know how much of it is kind of a cleanup and, and just saving face right now and trying to put something out there and getting ahead of it, or how much of it is the honest truth that these guys are really established and, and, and despite all this turmoil that they're moving forward here. Uh, it's mean, just hard to, hard to kind of be comfortable right now. Yeah, I mean, I had no doubt that they were good to go. But I don't – like, I'm not worried about this year. This yeah. year, I'm not worried about the teams that I think are are fine, that have been active, that have been um, – that are clearly making moves to be part of MLR 2024. Mm -hmm. What I'm worried about is, all right, what about next year? What about the year after that? Are you going to be making that same statement when you realize that it's another year of not making money, that it's another year of having to put up the same amount of money to lose – uh, to lose revenue and to lose profit on, on, on that investment, you know, at the end of the day, what these owners see is, is a business. And if this business is not going to start returning the investment that they're expecting, then why would they continue investing? Um, yeah. especially when it's owners that are not affiliated with North American rugby, like for example, the New York iron workers, when their ownership group was like, very heavily the same ownership group that was kind of part of the it's a new zealand ownership group what 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 motivation do they have to continue to develop north right. american rugby in the mlr um and then you look at guys like there's lots of owners out there and i think like bill webb that are that are very passionate about it but once you lose that what happens well like right somebody's gonna have to make a tough call so so it's great that they put out statements it's i'm sure that it was a it was an organized effort to kind of temper the the publicity um but i'm not worried about this year i think my concerns come in two years down the line three years down the line when i forget who it was but somebody i think it was killabrew who was saying oh we'll get to 32 teams like no you can't even keep 12 right so right, right. so it's like we'll see um but kind of just touching it and i know we're, we'll move forward from this a little bit but touching on um touching on la i, I get that there's been conversations with the ownership group but Look, you don't have any players. You don't have a coach. Mm -hmm. You don't have a team name. You don't have a jersey. You don't have, you know, the most we've seen is a logo on the conference layout from the MLR. And we've yeah. seen what happened to two of the teams that had logos on the conference graphic in the MLR, right? Like, um, so I'm not convinced with them, um, but we'll see. Uh, kind of shifting it back to New York here. I'm really... I think fantasy wise, Rai, um, I think this unfortunately is just going to reduce the player pool, right? Like, unfortunately, the talent is going to be so condensed into these 10 remaining teams um, that, look, we're looking at a smaller player pool. Yes, maybe we'll score more points and, and the players you have will score more points and you expect more talent from them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're looking at 10 starting fly hats. We're looking at 10 starting scrum hats. Right. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's going to be, that's going to be a tough one to handle because if you don't have one of those guys, you're taking a pretty big hit. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. And we'll get into it. Kind of the guys that are probably uh, the names that we need to be most aware of here when it comes to kind of a big fantasy shift. Um, one thing I do want to mention do the thing that probably I think stood out to me out of all the statements that were released by the teams were the Utah Warrior Rugby statement. And, and this was what provides a little bit of optimism for me is when he starts to talk about, um, uh, and this is uh, this is Kimball uh, Kshar, uh, the CEO and co-founder of the Utah Warriors, who says that um, it would be very, uh, and, and this is kind of a, um, you know, a paraphrase, but essentially it's very naive that you would expect that, you know, we wouldn't see things like this. It would be foolish to expect anything different to see these types of challenges coming. Every startup league, um, and he compares it to a startup business, uh, has uh, experienced things like this in its early days. Uh, he, uh, he he recites the MLS, which is probably the closest kind of um, you know uh, 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 comparison that you can make. But he cites the NBA, the NFL in its early days, and things like that. So. 
it's going to be interesting to see how the MLR responds. We talked about how the MLR was able to get through COVID and the pandemic season and bounce back from that. Um, the, the days where it has grown from the days where it was just, you know, six teams or, or whatever have you it was at the beginning and the way that it's grown now. I think there's a, 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 an opportunity for the league to step back, assess where it's at right now. And I think the next decisions that this league makes – for 2024 and like what you're saying Matt, years to come um, are going to be crucial. Uh, these next steps, I, I understand what Kimball is saying, uh, but I also at the same notion are saying that this is not just something you take for, for granted and just say, oh, you know, that losing teams is just part of, you know, the growth and, and, and thing of the league. You don't want to see that uh, especially, but I think right now uh, what, what it really highlights is that, okay, what does the league do from here now? What decisions are being made now Now with the 10 teams that you do have? And I think those decisions that they make here, moving forward here in the next coming months, in the next year, is going to dictate the trajectory yeah. in which the MLR is going to move here. There's but, still a chance. I'm not saying that the league I'm, – I'm definitely not saying that this league is going to fold or this league is in any sort of jeopardy. But we're both in agreement here, Matt – that there's we're at probably the most concerned about this league that we've ever been since we've been following it. And again, to highlight the decisions that are made now and in this next year are going to be really telling and really important and impact greatly if we are going to have a league uh, in, in, in a few years' time. And I hope that those decisions and those, those, uh, the, 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 the things that this league decides to do are the correct things. And we end up, you know, bouncing back from this and, and going back to to having the confidence that we at least we thought we had with this league kind of earlier this offseason. But uh, I guess we'll we'll figure out, um, you know, as the couple months come on here. But let's now kind of shift this, Matt, to I know we've been alluding to it, but let's shift this to kind of a more of a fantasy conversation. I think where the fantasy conversation really comes through here is what the league is doing with regards to these players that were part of these folded teams. So uh, the MLR released a competition update on December 8th and said that players on Toronto and New York may opt into a dispersal draft that is going to be taking place this week, uh, December 13th. Uh, the teams will draft players based on reverse order of the 2023 standings and are allowed to trade picks. So essentially it's exactly like uh, the MLR 2023 collegiate draft, except you're going to be dealing with players that, uh, that are on these Toronto and New York teams. Uh, the drafted athletes may negotiate with that team uh, who drafts them. Any undrafted players are eligible to sign wherever they may choose. And I guess what's interesting about this is that, and just with the timing, everything uh, is that uh, the athletes who opt into the draft are exempt from the 2024 MLR salary cap. So it kind of gives players that are without a home right now an opportunity um, to find a new home without, you know, teams really having to make a financial decision against that. Uh, so I guess we'll see. I mean, December 13th will be interesting. My guess is we're probably not going to see any of the results of these drafts. Nope. Um, uh, but I will allow the league to kind of prove me wrong. But it does say at the bottom there, which kind of makes me allude to, is that teams will announce the signings once they're confirmed. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where who, who opts in, where these players go. And I think to a greater fact, Matt, this will determine the opportunity that these guys have and how they slot into these lineups and whether or not, you know, they're going to be fantasy relevant guys here. Because again, I think I agree with you that the reduction to 10 teams and now these players being dispersed out, it's just going to hurt fantasy managers and trying to find guys that are going to be fantasy relevant. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think this this is a good thing that they did. I'm happy that this. I think one of the big concerns that we had was how are these guys going to find a spot on a team when they don't when there's a salary cap that needs to be considered? A lot of these big signings have already been made, so they're going to be salary cap exempt as long as they opt into the draft. You know, they could. I think uh, I think Larouge Rugby Derek Brissett was talking about this this idea of like, what if a guy opts into the draft, goes undrafted. And then now he's salary cap exempt and can sign which would with that whatever team he wants to sign for. Yeah. Uh, which would be obviously the ideal scenario. But I think some of those top players are definitely if you opt in, sure, they're gonna exactly. be looked at. Um I think to me, and I, I think kind of of guys that mainly on the Toronto arrows really of like, look, some of these guys realize and this may be like a, a point of this is kind of they don't want to go to another country. They don't want to work in another country. They don't want to go to another team, another city. They wanted to play for the Toronto Arrows. The Toronto Arrows were the only team that they were willing to play for. And now, you know, we're losing potentially 
some some key guys that were starters on this Toronto arrows team that maybe are, are are no longer going to be in the league. So it's unfortunate to kind of even think about that. Um, But I'll be interested to see where some of these guys go, where these guys get drafted, where these guys sign. Um, And I'll go back to my point there of like, look, if an Ed Fido is going to San Diego or something, or an Ed Fido is going to Houston, He's taking a, a winger spot. Is that going to be Nate Oxberger's spot? Is that going to be Thomas Eoaki's spot? Is that going right. to be, you know, Jerry Labuscagna's spot? Like, it'll be, it's, in fantasy-wise, we are going to be looking at, it's going to change the way that we look at some of these players and definitely change the way that we look at the draft boards and say, all right, how is this, how is this panning out? Because somebody yeah. who we thought was at the top of a guy's, uh, the top of the team's kind of depth chart, to use a football term, is now booted to number two, and now he's dropped in our board because of that. I mean, on a positive looking at it, though, I mean, some of these bottom teams, though, are going to benefit greatly. I mean, yep. think about the talent that's going to be available for the Miami Sharks, talent that's going to be available wow. for the Dallas Jackals, uh, talent that's going to be available for the Chicago Hounds. Um, you know, some of these lower-tier teams from last season, I mean, the timing could be great for them, uh, and they can be picking up some pretty good talent yeah. here, um, which... I guess you could argue these teams were going to obviously be, um, you know, these players were going to be fantasy relevant on the teams that they once were, but I don't think it's going to be an end all be all. There are a lot of guys who are on the Dallas Jackals, who are on the Chicago Hounds, um, and were who are on, you know, maybe who are going to be on the Miami Sharks that weren't going to be fantasy relevant, be just because of how you know lower kind of you know performance wise that they were going to be. You put an Ed Fido or or an Andrew Coe on any one of those teams, or 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 a Sam Malcolm, a Rui, Ruida Biddle, a Taringa Tiruatoki on any of those teams. Uh, you know, it turns them a little bit more fantasy relevant. So I think it's a yeah. double edged sword here. Um, but my question is though, what what concerns me is, I don't. It's kind of your same notion, Matt, with the Toronto Arrows and about guys who were wanting to live in Toronto and play for the Arrows. I find that I think it'll be probably more homegrown North American guys that will be opting into this draft. And I think guys who are maybe overseas may be taking a double look here and be like, Hey, all right, you know what? Um, I gave this league a go and I'm, yeah. I'm just going to stick with a league that's maybe closer to my hometown or my home country home yeah. nation than coming here. I don't know how to foresee this. I have no idea, but well, to I me, I mean, I actually think those guys haven't even, I mean, yes. Okay, so there's a chance that they don't get to choose where they want to go. But now they get to be salary cap exempt. Now these international players get to make the money that they want to make. They can request for a higher than what actually makes sense for teams to be able to pay considering the salary cap. Even though, you know, there is money being handed outside of the salary cap, whatever that is. That's a known fact. That's how we get these big players. Um, But maybe that's almost an alert to some of these guys of like, Hey, look, I'm all right with going to any of these teams. And I know that I can ask for more because I'm going to be salary cap exempt. Maybe that's it. But to your point, Ryan, and you bring up a really good point of like, man, if I was a player overseas and looking at this league from the outside in, yes, we've seen a lot of international signings, but now I'm looking at it and I'm like, Man, am I going to end up being on one of these teams that are yeah. that are going to fold after one season? Am I going to be end up signing with the team and then a month later they're not going to be like I'm not going to have a place to work uh when I kind of organize your whole season around that? Um I, I fear that that's definitely going to deter new international players from coming yeah. in. Yeah. Um even though we've seen this big influx of 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 guys so big names that kind of come off the top of my head uh, that are going to be guys that will be uh, interesting to keep an eye out for in terms of, uh, you know, guys that will be fantasy relevant um, and see whether or not they find new homes here. Uh, let's start off with the arrow side of things. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where Lucas Rumble goes. Um, you know, does he opt in the draft? He'll be a guy that's very yeah. fantasy relevant. Um, Sam Malcolm, uh, Mitch yeah. Richardson. Uh, we know, you know, Ruida Biddle, like I mentioned, Taranga Tira Waitokia, um, you know, uh, even Povey. where guys like Jack McRogers will go, um, you know, does a guy like Tua, Tua Latasi Tasi, you know, stay in the league? Um, these are probably the guys that are most fantasy relevant on the Toronto Arrows uh, that will be interesting to see whether or not they yeah. kind of go back there. Um, yeah. Robbie Povey as well. There. 
yeah, Robbie Povey, exactly, obviously, with the big signs. And that's what makes it interesting, too, is there were just so many big trades and signings that happened with this Arrows yeah. team ahead of this happening uh, that there was a lot of excitement about that uh, That we're not too sure what's going to happen here. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I wh- mean, how do you I... approach it, Matt? How, how, how are you – let's say – I mean, before we get into that, yeah. I mean, Toronto – I think Toronto is not where the big players are going to be drafted from. Like, the big players – that we're going to see is going to be New York. Like sure. that's sure. going to be the big one. We got Ed Fido. We got, we got Andrew Coe. We got Cara Pryor. We got guys like, you know, even Connor Buckley uh, or Connor McManus. Sorry. Yeah. Um, he's going to be a big player. Is Jack Hyden part of this as well? Sam Windsor, you know, you're looking at that New York squad and I'm going to say like the first 15 picks <laughs> first. Yeah. That's, that's a stretch. First five to seven picks are going to be rugby New York guys. You're looking at Dylan Fawcett, right? Like, mm-hmm. Man, like that, to have those New York guys kind of spread out um, into the league is gonna be is gonna be pretty interesting because those are the guys that I think are gonna be are gonna be the big the big hitters there and the big signings and the big announcements. Yeah, uh, from a fantasy perspective, the top ten guys uh, to Matthew's point, uh, when you combine both New York and Toronto, um, you're looking at um, you know five the top five in that top 10 yeah. are New York guys. But, Andrew Coe with 168.8 yeah. fantasy points. Ed Fido, 150.1. Uh, Fasu Fuatai, 147 fantasy points. Tay Walden, 143. And then Jason Emery, 137.5. And, the next guy, the first Toronto guy is the sixth spot. Uh, Mitch Richardson with 126.2. Um, and then you and this is what the big, the big caveat, especially for the rugby New York guys, we don't actually know who is... Obviously. We don't actually know who's contracted with the team and, and like right right actually maybe that's a question of like all right you know who's eligible for the draft is it if i have signed if i'm currently within a contract yeah. if i was planning on signing if i was in a contract with them last year am i eligible um that would be interesting but sorry right i cut off your question your initial question of 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 my approach yeah no this. i guess i might i maybe this is something that you really can't answer until we see this dispersal draft kind of take place um but i mean does it really just all come down to the confidence you have in the skill player so let's say for example andrew co right the the number one fantasy point scorer in out of this dispersal drive 168.8 fantasy points last season he yeah. goes to a team let's say you know like the chicago hounds right or 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 the miami sharks how much confidence you have in his skill set that he's going to automatically interject himself into the starting lineup there versus it being so late into the season and these teams establishing what they have. And I guess preseason hasn't begun yet. And teams, I don't think have been necessarily training uh, too much, um, you know, at this point in time. So there's still the time to kind of get integrated into uh, the, the game plan and the game style, but how much of that, you know, uh, is concerning you. I don't think that concerns me too much, especially, I mean, yeah, I don't think at least, especially with rugby, like guys are so used to just jumping into lineups. Guys are so used to coming in and, you know, they've played enough club rugby to be able to kind of come in and, and play, uh, play after a week of just learning some of this, like at the end of the day, it's still preseason. They're all going to learn kind of the, the moves and the set piece and things at the same time. Um, and, and, you know, guys are still making teams are still making signings going into the new year. So they're not going to be the newest guys on the squad. Um, so I don't have any concerns with that. My, more of my concern is like, where do we see these guys end up landing? Like if we see a guy like Andrew Co land in San Diego, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit concerned because his playing time is going to be impacted. I mean, you look at the back three there and that's, that's pretty, if he lands in a place like Utah, I'm going to be pretty concerned because it's hard to crack a, a back three that has Caleb McAnee, you know, Joe Mono and, and potentially Mika Kruse, right? Like that's, that's tough. That's tough to crack. And, um, that's what I'm more concerned about. And that's what I'm going to be looking for is like, and we talk about this when we look at the collegiate draft of like, where's the opportunity. If he gets drafted somewhere, does he have opportunity there? And then what does that mean for the guy that I think is going to be right. in that position? Right. Um, 
for me, that's going to be the big thing. I'm not too worried about the whole like getting into grips with the team and, and taking time to get used to the team. I'm more concerned about, hey, is, is this affecting playing time? Is this affecting opportunity? If so, then look, I'm sorry, but you're, dro- you're dropping in the draft. Yeah, so when we when we find out the results of this draft, if and when we do, and and if January, and when we find probably. out these signings, uh, if they do follow through, um, there'll be a, there'll be a few things to consider. It'll be the skill of the guy that's going over to whatever team. It'll be the opportunity that exists on that team. Obviously, I would rather see, right? Maybe not from you know Ed Fido's or Andrew Coe's perspective, but I would rather see Andrew Coe land on a Miami Sharks or, or a Chicago I don't think as, a fantasy, at, yeah. as a fantasy manager. I would want that just because I know that the, the opportunity is going to be great there. And with the skill set there, at least he'll be there. And it's a guy that I know is going to get the 80 minutes more likely versus a San Diego, because it's just as, as at least as a fantasy manager, I'm, 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 it's a double-edged sword there when he's going to San Diego, right? You're, you're not only losing the value of Andrew Coe, because he's not going to see the same opportunity, but you're also losing the value. Because it's not like they're not going to use Andrew Coe. Uh, yeah. You're going to also lose the value of, you know, a Joe Mono or a Nate Oxford because yeah, they're going to also not be on the field too. So true. it'll be interesting to see how this kind of plays out. Again, I think there's a lot of unknown here. And I think just go back to the same sentiment. What the league decides to do here moving forward in some of these decisions is going to be very, very impactful on, on what's going to dictate the trajectory of this league. And that includes this dispersal draft. That includes the communication that's going forward. I think the big sentiment that I've seen is that the league's got to get this under grips losing two teams in a span of a few months uh, uh before the season and in, in, in the matter of a, a week or so is not a good look and i think there's a lot of concerned fans right now and 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 there's just a whole lot of unknown when you throw in la into the mix and all that stuff uh we're just gonna have to figure out and wait and see but uh yeah. it starts off with the dispersal drafts on december 13th and fantasy managers will want to keep an eye out on that and that i think this is going to be probably the biggest thing greater than the collegiate draft greater than you know the dispersal draft that we had earlier for the miami sharks this will probably be the biggest roster change or or i don't know how you want to classify but the biggest kind of league decision move that has happened in the course that we've done this fantasy mlr thing that is going to have the biggest impact on fantasy. i think it'll be very similar to the gilgronis guiltinis sure sure yeah, it'll be, very, yeah. It'll, it'll be exactly like that, actually. Um, gotcha. So we'll see how that works out. Um, and, and yeah, just a last fantasy note before we start heading into the signings and I start telling you why we should stop listing Miami Sharks as a bottom team. Um, <laughs> uh, is, you know, when we when we grow this to, to more people um, and more people are allowed, this is going to also kind of make you look at, okay, what is the ideal number as as a commissioner of a fantasy rugby league? What is the ideal number of players that you want in your league, right? Yeah. Like you're going to have to look at this and and I'm going to continue to act like LA doesn't exist because to me right now they don't exist. We've got 10 teams. You basically can't have more than a 10 team league. That's and moment, that's what I was just going right? to say. I was going to say as the, as the commissioner of the Fantasy Rockers League, this basically dictates that you cannot have more than a 10 team league. You can't because there are, like I said before, and I kind of alluded to it is there are going to be 10 starting fly halves going to be 10 starting scrum halves. Um, and I mean, some of these positions that are just, you don't expect them to be subbed out or, or the backup to get much yeah. minutes. Um, it's really tough to, to start a guy, start a 10 or a nine that's coming off the bench. I mean, yeah, yeah sometimes you have to, but if you're going to have to do that all season, that's not going to be ideal. Um, but yeah, this definitely has, you know, it'll have an impact on not just the the managers, but the commissioners. I mean, the way I'm looking at it, uh, even if with the optimism of saying, okay, let's say the LA team does exist and we have 11 teams in this league, the optimum number right now, for me at least, is eight teams. <laughs> that's yeah. probably what we're heading into the 2024 year with is that I think eight team, an eight team fantasy MLR league is going to be the, the ideal number. And that kind of reflects, I mean, we had what 12 teams last season. Um, so, yeah. you know, and we had 10 teams there kind of gives that buffer of, uh, you know, there will be a starting fly half or a scrum half available in your league. Yeah. Um, and this kind of 
reflects that. So yeah, we'll see. Sure. I mean, a whole bunch of decisions that are going to be made, both logistically for fantasy MLR that this will have an impact on, uh, both player value wise. So uh, we'll learn I more mean, as as it kind of comes through, and, yeah. and we'll kind of take or, it thoughts as they come. Or have twelve teams. You know, be a crazy <laughs> commissioner. Have twelve teams in your league and make it so cutthroat that like. <laughs> you see the first round in the draft just being 10 straight fly halves so that they can make sure that they get a starting one. I mean, Matt, we've hey. had that before. I mean, you look yeah. at some of these, like I'm in like a 14 team NFL league. And even that is like, like yeah. you're picking I mean, up some guys that are crazy. And I couldn't even imagine, if, you know, a 12 team uh, fantasy MLR is, is hard enough already. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to be in for uh, a journey of a ride. If you're going to be doing a 12 team fantasy MLR, that's the type of year you want to have. You go for it. You yeah, know? yeah, no kidding. Who am All I right, to well, tell you to stop? Um, again, uh, I think, again, it will be the communication that comes out from this league, and we're going to find out it. a whole lot None more that's going to impact this fantasy stuff here. Uh, but, again, just just not a great couple weeks for the MLR here. And, and I'd be lying to tell you that this is probably the most concerned that I've been uh, for the MLR uh, since I've been following this league, but uh, we'll we'll try to keep positive here. I know that the yep. the sentiment and the the vibe right now among MLR fans is pretty tough. Yeah, uh, but, but hey, uh, we'll we'll try to look on the bright side of things. And let's get again, to the teams that do exist right now. Yeah, let's, let's get let's to the teams that. that are making moves because there's some exciting stuff. There's a few of them that I uh, happened in the past week that I am excited to talk about. All right. Well, let's start off here with the Chicago Sound, uh, the Not Chicago that. Hounds. Uh, a couple of international signings here. Uh, they signed both Ignacio Paculo and Guillermo Payudas uh, from Oof, the nice. Uruguayan international uh, team. They both appeared in the uh, past Rugby World Cup in France. Uh, both front row players. It'll be interesting to see what they do. And this one's a fun one too. They signed Cash Malu- Maluya. I don't know. I can't help <laughs> Cash. We'll go with him. I love it. Uh, he's actually a NFL draft pick. He got drafted by the New England Patriots. Yeah, you uh, And uh, he joins from the American Raptors. He uh, has been playing there that. since 2021, uh, appearing in the Super Rugby Americas in 2023. And now he uh, uh, center back three player Cash going to the Chicago Hounds. And, and the MLR it. continues to win against the, the Saram. Because guys clearly don't want to lose for the Glendale Raptors anymore. He wants to lose with the Chicago Hounds now. And I mean, and that is an optimistic sign. I mean, uh, the fact that we're still having players coming over from Super Rugby Americas, yep. uh, despite everything. That's well, going actually, on. I'm the optimism from this week is the fact that you know there are some. You know, you are a talented player if you're pl- if you're part of a Rugby World Cup team, especially for a talented team like Uruguay. Um, and we've got Chile, I know we're going to announce, and we've got maybe some Argentina, some Las Pumas international experience. So, um, no, I think it's still great to see that we're getting some quality guys that are coming in from, you know, guys who have international experience at the level of the World Cup. All right, shipped on on over to Old Glory DC to talk about uh, maybe this Lost Pumas guy that you're mentioning here, uh, Martin Vaca, a hooker. Uh, he has appeared for the U20 uh, Lost Pumas team. Uh, he signs with Old Glory, uh, Old Glory DC, uh, which should be uh, uh, interesting. There, uh, he was uh, with uh, the uh, 2021 Super Rugby Americas champion, uh, the Hawa- uh, Guarez. Um, uh, right. Joins from the Narbonnet squad uh, in the na- French National Division. Um, yeah, and Martin Vaca has. The MLR like- continues to win here. You know, there more you Saram, more Saram movers. Uh, I think this one's a big one, uh, especially with you know the loss of Nick Sushan. I think he's got a nice some sho- nice shoes to fill, um, and I'm looking forward to him having some fantasy relevance this year for Old Glory DC. Uh, Brady Daniel, brother of Corey Daniel, is returning uh, mm, to Old Glory DC, uh, back rower. Uh, didn't really have a fantasy impact last season, only scoring 0.9 fantasy points, but that was because he only had Checks a couple out. of sub-on appearances. Uh, he has played, I believe, three caps up to date for Old Glory DC. Um, he's still looking to make that first start, but just maybe a guy you want to have on your radar to see whether or not he punches through in that lineup and has a little bit more of a fantasy-relevant impact. Yep. Uh, this one's a pretty big one. Uh, the Dallas Jackals are really re-signing Nicholas Revel Pitt, a front rower. Uh, He was a guy that actually had some fantasy relevance, kind of a streaming guy that you could put Mm -hmm. in there, started seven of his 10 caps for the Jackals in 2023, scoring two tries. He finished off as the front row 32, uh, 214th overall. And this was a guy, yeah, if he was starting uh, and you were in need of a front row guy, you could probably slot him in there and just hope for the best. Yeah. And you know, you know, with our league and the way the fantasy rugby works, the props aren't as popular, but he was definitely a guy that made his way on and off rosters throughout the year. And as a prop, that's pretty impressive. 
Yeah, a fantasy high 11 points scored in round 13 when he had one try, 44 meters gained, and seven tackles. 10.6 was his second highest in round five uh, when he had uh, 22 meters gained, eight tackles, and three breakdown steals. So um, a guy that, uh, yeah, we'll see where uh, where Revel Pitt kind of falls through. Uh, the Nola Gold now, uh, pretty active here this, uh, yeah. this week uh, when it came to signing some guys. And we'll start off with uh, one of the international signings that you were alluding to there. We'll mark off the Chileans that are coming in here. Uh, Domingo Savadra. Nice. <laughs> a center for uh for uh, uh Chile who made their first appearance in the Rugby World Cup uh yep. in 2023. Uh this one should be interesting. We'll see where he kind of slots in the lineup. A lot of excitement yeah. here. I mean, I think guys are talking about like Jordan Jackson Hope, JP Duplessis and uh Domingo here. Um we'll see about that. I, I have this feeling that you make a bigger international signing that potentially at, and I, I don't I don't. I can't recall whether. I don't think they believe they've confirmed Jordan Jackson Hope's return. Um, so we'll see how this fits and what this means for him as well. Yeah, uh, and again, it's always when you guys are pulling uh, from talent that was in the Rugby World Cup, it's always uh, positive to see that. Um, another guy that uh, Nola Gold has re-signed is Jared Adams. And this is this a guy is that was very fantasy relevant, finished off as the 10th best front rower in fantasy MLR, 123rd overall with 77.8 fantasy points. Um, yeah, Jared Adams was definitely a guy that you were rostering on your on your squad um, here for yep. fantasy, and it looks like he's returning to uh, the Nola Gold. Yeah, he was one of the props that was, you know, we talked about how props just weren't as popular, but he was one of the props that, I mean, he was like a Sam Malolo at prop, uh, just the way he ran the ball and the way that he was able to get meters gained just unexpectedly. And, and uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty big. Yeah, season high 93 meters gained uh, ran in uh, round 11 when he scored his highest point total, 10.8 fantasy points um, there when he added 10 tackles as well. Um, so, yeah, Jared Adams, kind of the guy that you could kind of your next round of front rower relevant fantasy players who were not at the hooker position because of that meters gained um, potential that you mentioned, Matt. So, uh, yeah. Jared Adams, definitely a guy that uh, people have on their list as a late front row guy that they could have on their bench or kind of if they're going to yes. punt that position, maybe have Jared Adams at that. Yeah. lineup as well and then uh, uh a signing here that we'll see kind of how it plays out but augusto bohm and uh is signing with the uh nola gold he was playing overseas with selknam but he has mlr experience in 2022 played with seattle and dallas uh he's a hooker um we'll see where he slots in with the nola gold um yeah. they just know, resigned paddle tool they so. just resigned paddle tool which i was just gonna say yeah um but However, this starting lineup kind of shakes out. It should be interesting because whoever is at that hooker position uh, will have a definitely fantasy value here for the mm -hmm. 2024 year. 100%. I totally agree. All right. And now shifting over to the Houston Sabercats, the Sabercats have re-signed Dom Aquino, which is a big one because this oh, is one of the like top fantasy players of 2023. Finished off as their sixth best center uh, of last year, 23rd overall, 155.2 fantasy mm -hmm. points on the season. Uh, Dom Aquino returning with the Sabercats. This one's a big one. Yeah, I, I really like this. I mean, we saw Dom Aquino kind of get injected into that, have a solidified starting role last year for the Houston Sabercats, and he kind of came out guns a-blazing. Uh, we really got used to seeing him and Christian Dyer just being that midfield pairing, and he just really explode um, and have a lot of fantasy relevance, I think, especially early on in the season. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's great to see him back. He's going to be on the uh, – taken in the draft for sure and he's going to be pretty big parts of fantasy managers team this year yeah he was kind of that outside kind of next best center kind of group coming in yeah. he had the meters gain potential scored a high of 17.1 in uh in round three there with 61 meters gained a try a try assist and 10 tackles i think what separates the kind of the top tier centers from Dom McKean is probably those tackle numbers. He was averaging probably around six or seven tackles a game. Mm -hmm. uh, most of centers that were really, really fantasy relevant were getting upwards of the 15, 16. He had a high of 11 uh, in round 10 and round six, but you just never saw that explosive game with him. But nonetheless, you were never quite disappointed with him. He had a few yeah. five point games here and there, but he was more or less going to give you a double digit fantasy point performance, or at least near that. So kind of your, uh, you know, outside looking in type center that you'll look at. And I'm sure he'll be kind of one of those value bargain guys that you'll be able to get kind of lower end in the draft here outside after those kind of top guys coming through. So uh, Akena returning as a Houston Sabercat. Uh, some big signings here for the uh, the MLR finalists of 2023, the San Diego Legion. 
Uh, and this is an, uh, a familiar name because you might have seen him last season appearing a few times here for the Houston Sabercats, who we just to talk about. Yeah. But Nick Boyer, coming back to the San Diego Legion. He had played there before. Only 25.8 fantasy points in 2023, but he really never established himself with the Houston Sabercats there. Uh, he was kind of that marquee name with the Sabercats at that scrum app position, uh, but Carlo Denyshin really established himself there last year uh, for the Sabercats. Um, so Nick Boyer moving on from Houston, going to San Diego, finished uh, again, like I said, the 22nd best scrum half last year, 299th overall, but this is a team that uh, that just recently lost their their scrum half there, and we'll see where that goes. Yeah, they lost both of them. Um, I don't think Nick Boyer is the answer. Um, so, yeah, either they have plans for Nate Augsburger to start there or they're still in search for a starting scrum half. Uh, Nick Boyer is not the answer for that San Diego, <laughs> San Diego Legion squad, I'm sorry to say. Um, so look for them to either make another move to get another scrum half or – you know, if this stays the way it is, I would think that Nate Oxberger would be starting at nine ahead of Nick Boyer. Okay, in a in a in a in a alternate world where Nick Boyer is the starting nine for He's the not. San Diego Legion, where does he go in your rankings right now? Like if Nick Boyer is a He's not. He's like the, he's like on the last. He's the last nine that you would pick. Like if we had ten teams and the league has ten teams, I, I'm. I'm going to just pick him because I don't have an, not any nines left. <laughs> Even with him being on the San Diego Legion? I mean, you can be on whatever team you want, but if all you're going to do is like <laughs> pass the ball and give – like remember that the San Diego Legion, all jokes aside, like the San Diego Legion team was driven through Richard Judd. Sure, sure. Like the six, you, you can have all the players. If you can't give your 10 good ball, if you don't have good service, if you don't play – like you can't play the play style that they need to play in order to be successful – it doesn't matter. So um, I thought, you know, I would rate Jason Higgins over him. Um, and, and you know, I just think that, yeah, I just don't think that he's the answer here. I don't think that he's going to be the starting starting nine. All right. And shifting over to another kind of big signing here. It's this is the one. Yeah. Provide some clarity here for what's going to happen at this fly half position with the San Diego Legion. Because last year with the Legion, um, when we look into it, uh, they had Will Hooley and Josh Henderson who kind of split time there at that fly half yeah. position. But they're adding a guy to the mix that is going to make things interesting. And that is the New Zealand fly half Lincoln McClutchy. Uh, for 2024, uh, comes from the NPC Bunnings, having played for the Magpies. He has played in Super Rugby with Moana Pacifica. Um, this is a guy that has experience, is high-level talent. I don't see a world where Lincoln McClutchy isn't breaking through um, and at least having a significant amount of playing time at that fly half position for San Diego. Yeah, and with the Will Hooley retirement, I think they needed to, to land big here. Uh, I don't know what's happening with Josh Henderson. I'm assuming he's back. But regardless, Lincoln McClutchy will be the starting fly half for the San Diego Legion. I mean, he comes off a pretty big season with the Hawks Bay Magpies, taking them to the finals. Um, and also being the 2023 NBC Bunnings Cup top point scorer. Um, he's gonna, he's definitely gonna be starting there. He's gonna make a big impact in this league. Um, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna be very fantasy relevant. And don't be surprised when you see him up in the top three of my top five for this fly half position, uh, because he's gonna take this team to new places. I think this is a huge addition for San Diego Legion. This is even a step up if they had the same team last year. I think this is even a step up from what they had last year. 10 was really the only position that you looked at San Diego Legion and said, hey, you know, they they had talent there, but it wasn't the same caliber of talent as the rest of their back line. And I think now they found their guy. Um, and he's gonna be he's gonna be an absolute stud. And I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in one of the top three of point scorers this upcoming season. All right. Well, I guess you answered my question. My question for you was gonna be he's gonna be top five fly half off the board, no question, right? Uh, yeah, well, he's going to be top three in my top five, at least whether you want to listen to that or not, but I'm, I, I would see him as probably the top, I would say the third fly half off the board. All right. Uh, let's shift on over now to the Miami Sharks, Matt, another signing that you're pretty and excited about. This uh, is why we got to stop. We got to stop. My Ryan, Miami Sharks is no longer a bottom team. All right. <laughs> this team is now, I mean, let's just look at the staples here and, and I'll let you announce it, but they've got. Thomas Gubelli at nine, Nicholas Sanchez at 10, right? They named the two Welsh internationals. I forget mm -hmm. their names, but they're there. The two Welsh internationals, the World Cup internationals um, in their forward pack. 
And Ryan, now they've announced. Uh, I'm going to let you announce it, but now they've announced. Uh, Nick Greg. Yes, <laughs> Nick Greg. Nick Greg. Uh, he played uh, for the. Uh, uh, he has Scotland uh, international experience. Uh, recently coming from the Magpies as well. Uh, he's New Zealand born, uh, but he's capped for Scotland at both the sevens and fifteens levels, and uh, he's has almost a uh, hundred caps with the Glasgow Warriors. So talk about another guy who has experience. High level professional experience yeah. coming to a Miami Sharks team that is looking to make a statement out the gate here in their first season. And a consistent starter for Hawks Bay. Uh again, took them, helped them with their finals run. Um, he's like this five nine, two hundred pound guy that just like he like he he reminds me, he looks like a John Ryberg, but with skill. So <laughs> So like that, that's he he's built like John Ryberg, but then he's actually got hands and can play rugby. So it's like, you know, that's 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 what I see. And I would have big expectations for him as well. I mean, I think he'll slot into that outside center position. I think he'll do well. I'm excited to see him play in the MLR. I'm definitely and quite possibly gonna have him in, among the top five centers. We'll see. Um but yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited for this one. You, uh, this Miami team is is shaping up, and I think one of our concerns with this Miami team, Rye, was like, all right, we get it. You can dr- you can bring in Argentinian talent. You can bring in international talent. You've got money to bring in international talent. This dispersal draft that's going to happen is going to allow them to bring in that North American talent that they need to fill out the quota, mm-hmm. um, which I think will help them massively. And if I mean. Are they the the draft is based on the standings of last year? This means yeah. Miami theoretically should get the first pick. Yeah, I don't know how that's going. I have no idea. I'm assuming they do. Know. I'm assuming they do. Uh, so my Miami or LA get the first pick. I mean, if LA exists, so Miami or LA. I get, get the my, first but my pick. guess is that LA will just get what Rugby Atlanta got last year. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Good point. So Miami gets the first pick. All right, so now you're throwing what? An Ed Fido on this team? Like, are you throwing an Andrew Cole on this team? Like, that, like, Miami is, is going to be looking dangerous this year. Um, they're going to fill out their squad with be some careful. North American you're, players. You're, you're and, treading uh, my Chicago Hounds territory from last season. Well, I got burned. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, you got burned, Ryan, but I'm no you. More confidence. I'm, the I'm confidence a former, that you had in I'm Chicago a, Hounds last year or the confidence you have the Miami Sharks going to this year? I have more confidence in Miami Sharks. I mean, Chicago Hounds did not have, look, like, sweet. They had, uh, you know, they pick up Billy Meeks. Sweet. They pick up, uh, you know, they pick up, uh, uh, you know, Chris Matina, all the other guys from the Go Gronies. Um, great. You picked them up from the Go Gronies and, and Giltinis, but you did not pick up Thomas Cubelli. You did not sure, pick up Nico sure. Sanchez. Like, these are this talent that they're acquiring from internationally, like from the internationals is just a step up from, from what the Chicago hounds was able to get through that dispersal draft. All right. All right. And then last team that we got to go over in this one is oh the my New England. Gosh. This isn't Jets. news. Well, we knew of it. it's not, we not knew so who called, who called the, everybody's <laughs> raving about these jerseys. And I was like, all right, sweet. It's got collars and horizontal stripes. Like always. <laughs> Uh, well, for those of you who uh, who have not heard, but the New England Free Jacks did uh, is the first team to have announced their new kit for the upcoming 2023 or 2024 season uh, with the uh, the provider of Kappa Kappa. I like it though. I mean, I of course I, I you like it. You like I, the I, thing. I mean, look. Hopefully, the YouTube watchers can see the jersey up there. But like, it's right. Yeah. Right. It's it's. <laughs> It's Just it's because, exactly it, what what did it, I call it? What did it, I call Ryan? What have I been saying for two weeks since we started talking about this kit, Miss? Like sick. It's gonna have like who? What are you excited if it about? Ain't broke, it's got a new. It. It's, oh, great. I I agree. Hundred percent agree. <laughs> but doesn't mean you need to get excited about it. It's like seeing the Leafs jersey come out. Like awesome. It looks the same. <laughs> great. Sure. They added a stem to the leaf. Great. It's like it's blue and white. Awesome. It it's the exact same jersey. It's the exact same color. It's got a new logo on it. And yeah, I don't know. I'm not I mean, excited. I, I, I don't really one, care. The one <laughs> the one thing that I don't really like about oh, yeah? it is the Kappa Kappa logos running down the side of the shorts. 
Okay. I didn't even notice that because I didn't even look that hard at the photo because I was like, <laughs> from I didn't even click on the photo because I saw what it was and it was the exact yeah. same. And not, I actually, well, do you, what's running down the side there of the jersey? The sponsor, I think. Okay. Yeah. So we can read that on TV, apparently. <laughs> Maybe when they're sideways in a scrum or like a rock or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's almost as good as the dude wipes. I see. I mean, I'm more. I'm more. I'm more interested to see how the dude wipes fit into this. Will the dude wipes interfere with the side like Kappa Kappa there. logos? No, I think. No, they have to have the dude. If they lose a dude wipes, and this kit has taken a step back, and like that's true. I that is the only change that I wanted to. I I didn't want to see. I'm, I just wipes. tell me whether dude wipes is still there, and I'm happy. Just okay. show the shorts. I mean, look. That was the most important thing of their. They showed There's the alloy the therapeutics, so they got to show us the dude wipes if it's on their butt or not. Yes, we'll see. I will see. It, it but, looks like it's not there, but um, let's let's I commend. Like it. I like the the free jazz jersey. Yeah, and Might let's commend them. Exciting. Let's commend them. Uh, MLR teams. Uh, MLR. Uh, this is how you stay alive. This is how you do not fold. You release your kit. And you advertise your kit and you market your kit before Christmas because you have fans. Yeah. You have people that watch your games Yeah, that maybe want to wear a jersey this upcoming season. I can and you know what? Dude maybe... is still there. Yes. See? <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Happy to see it. Thank you for the confirmation, Rye. <laughs> this is big. Um, but yeah, like this is how you do it. New England Free Jazz continuing to set the standard, you know, continue to set the standard how to run a franchise, how to run a business, how to market a team, how to market the players. I love to see it. Quick yeah. question before we get into the 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 whatever the stupid star thing. Um, <laughs> did they? Did we always have three jerseys as teams? I don't think so. Other than no. like, let's not talk about the whole like like space jerseys. jerseys. Yeah, yeah. Th those don't Same count. Ones. But like, no, I don't think we did three jerseys. Yeah. So last year they had white. And yeah. they had red. Yeah. So the blue is new. Is it? I thought the – didn't they have blue? I don't know. But we have three jerseys this year. They That's got three great. jerseys, and they all got horizontal stripes. Just like each one has one less horizontal stripe. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so. Each one has one less. That is exactly it. Um, but, I, I mean, I love it, though. I, 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 I think it's great. Uh, what are yeah. your thoughts on the Kappa logo on the socks? Uh – too much Fine. kappa. Too much there's kappa, of, there's, there's kappa. There's a there's, there's a, a lot, lot of kappa. kappa. I guess they really want to make sure they're seen. Yeah. Um, I do like the logo though. I like you know it's a it's an iconic little soccer logo. Um, I guess they got to put it on there. Yeah. Uh, I will I won't bash them so much. I will pick my favorite. The white one is clearly the cleanest one out of all of them. Yeah. Um, and that's where you probably need the dude wipes the most. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I like the blue ones to be honest. Um, but to your point, Matt, to kind of round this out. The New England Free Jacks have created the blueprint for how to run a MLR franchise successfully. Yeah, they were the it, first ones to announce their rosters, yep. right? And they had that out there, and they have it all all set up. Mm -hmm. uh, they have announced their jerseys ahead of Christmas time. Well, um, not even just announced whole... it; they told everybody, "Hey, we're announcing it on this date. Get sure, excited! Sure, get excited sure. for this date!" And they and followed they through with it. And they, they had it for their season ticket holders and they released it on social media ahead of Christmas time for everyone to buy through. The, yeah, MLR, this is how you run a franchise. It is no surprise uh, why the New England Furry Jacks were the 2023 MLR champions um, and why they're one of the most successful franchises uh, when it comes to consistency and performance uh, that we've seen at least in the past few years. It is little things like this. It just seems from top to bottom, this New England Free Jacks team is being run correctly. Yep. And we'll see whether or not some teams can kind of pick this up and, and do what they're doing yep. because this is how it should look for all the teams for a professional league. Yeah, um, for, for there, there are two teams in this league that I have. If this league in five years down the road were to fold, these two teams would still be standing. And would still they would run the ML. It would just be two team league, just these guys, Seattle Sea Wolves mm -hmm. and the New England Free Jacks. It would just yep. be East versus West, and they would just face each other all year long, fifteen yeah. times. I agree. I agree. And uh, they, those two are, are. I mean, New England Free Jacks have definitely shown up this year, and the Seattle Sea Wolves are, are need to keep up. Uh, but those are the two teams that I think, franchise wise, they run themselves well, um, and, and they they definitely run the MLR franchise the way that we would expect all the teams to run it. 
Absolutely. All right. Last piece of news. Uh, the New England Free Jacks, uh, to round it out here, uh, will be adding a star to the top of their logo to commemorate <sighs> their 2023 MLR championship. Uh, the only other team that does this right now is Sea Wolves, who I believe have two stars on their jerseys, I want to say. Um, but this is cool. I mean, it's kind of like a European style. And I think Premiership, Premiership teams does that because I know Leinster has done it with their jersey when it comes to the Heineken Cup and the European Championship that they've done in the past. Um, I know, obviously, soccer teams do this. New England Free Jacks are adding a star to the top of their logo. Right. Is that not just Jam Delay making an edit on the logo saying that they should have added the star? <laughs> I'm like pretty sure <laughs> yeah, it is. that that's Jam Delay saying that they should have <laughs> added this stuff. All right, so sick. Nothing's actually changed. <laughs> no, nothing's changed with 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 New England. So it's Free only Jack. the Seattle SeaWolves that have it. Wow, this makes us look. Jake, well, look, look. You're look, a reliable look. source. You cannot be making edits like this and making it seem on first hand that this is real news. To be fair. It looks good. It says pretty clearly on the top there that I guess New England Free Jacks didn't go with my idea. But sometimes reading is not our forte, Ryan, and I understand. I understand. We like to see graphics from Jam Delay. We like to see stats. We like to see numbers. When he starts putting words in there, it, it messes with my head, and I don't know what Twitter account right. I'm looking at. Right, um, so, so let's correct ourselves. No star added. No star added. Jerseys look the same. Jerseys look the same. They still got dude wipes wiping their butts. They still got dude wipes. But they got a lot of kappa. They got a lot of kappa. I think that's that, that, that's that is that's a that's the consensus of the yes. New England Free Jazz jersey. There we okay. go. Um, yeah, I would have liked to see the star there. I, I think it's a cool idea, but I think it's like a Sea Wolves. Yeah, I think it's I think it's awesome. Like guys, just I think it's awesome. Teams pointing towards their past, their yeah. history, whatever it is. Um, you know, I know in the World Cup, the teams that put the trophies on the on the on their shoulder or on their sleeves. Yeah, um, you know anything excuse me, anything to commemorate uh, kind of, hey, this is the success that we've had. Maybe he starts asking questions like, hey, what's that gold thing on the back of their jersey? And it's like, oh, that's because they're reigning champions or they're former right, champions. Right. So, uh, yeah, definitely would jam the lay on this one. Glad to see Seattle Seals. Again, two franchises that just know how to do it. All right. Well, uh, that's about does it for the news and notes segment for this episode. Again, the biggest thing here uh, the folding of the New York iron workers. And I think to close out the show, uh, we'll just say it once again for all the fans out there and for all the fantasy MLR fans out there. Uh, I think we just got to try our best to look at this with a silver lining and try to look as optimistic, uh, optimistic as possible. Again, we'd be lying if Matthew and myself weren't at the highest concern level with this league that we've been in uh, since starting this thing. And since watching the MLR, but we hope we can trust what the MLR is going to do here moving forward. Hopefully there'll be a little bit of clarity coming out in the next couple of weeks, starting with the dispersal draft. And again, uh, I can't emphasize enough that the decisions that the MLR will make here on out, especially in the near future will dictate the trajectory of where this league will go. And hopefully uh, we can all stand together and uh, you know, hope that the MLR makes those right decisions. And in turn that fantasy MLR can continue to live on with this league as we continue to grow this thing. And for the 2024 year, we'll have a whole bunch of people enjoying yep. MLR in a unique way for many we are, wait, uh, for many years to come. So we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, it starts off with a dispersal drive, which should be interesting. Going to have a huge fantasy impact, Maddie. Yep, should be an interesting December. So, uh, All right. Well, for Maddie, for myself, this is episode 89 of the Fantasy Rucker Show, and we will be back. Happy holidays, everybody. Love you, MLR. Miss you, Vandy. You've been listening to the Fantasy Ruckers Show, bringing fantasy rugby to the masses, covering everything rugby from the MLR and beyond. We hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and be sure to tell all your friends. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, connect with us on social media at the Fantasy Ruckers. Till next time, this is the Fantasy Ruckers Show, signing off.